Hello, everyone, and welcome to week one of the summer term. I'm Professor Rios, and I wanted to, this is how all the lesson videos will be. Basically, it's a desktop version of what would otherwise be the in-class presentation. Uh, there's really no administration to this, as in no administrative information, anything for that. You should refer to the class page the syllabus and the welcome video, among other videos that may be sent that are specific to administration. Uh, this is getting right into the material. Having said that, because it is a summer course, this basically is one week here, a second week and a third week during the regular term. So it's a little bit longer. So my recommendation to you would be maybe do it a chunk at a time, manage your time that way so that it is easier to digest, so to speak. Okay. Now it's a lot of information. So, you know, do your best to set yourself up for the best possible outcome when it comes to the material. So each of these files is linked to a Google Drive. And that's available in the class page as well. So be mindful of that. I recommend you don't print them, just save them to your computer. All right, having said that, we're going to begin with, well, of course, week one, part one. Surprising, huh? We'll begin with this. And again, welcome to Physical Geography 101 for the summer. This week, we will have these objectives or for this particular lesson. And again, I know it says week one, uh, and this is actually really week one of the regular term, spring or, or fall. So that may be a little confusing from time to time, but just be mindful that the videos that are found within each weekly folder in the summer belong to that week. So just keep that in mind. Uh, these are the three units that this lesson here covers. This is my info. There is my email at the bottom. The office hours are available uh, as of the creation of this video on Blackboard. Eventually, when it migrates over to uh, Brightspace, it will be on Brightspace, but it will still be Zoom. Okay. There's a YouTube page for the course and Twitter, which is used weekly. These are the required texts. If you have any questions on this, contact me separately. So let's begin with just what is geography? You know, the discipline that is both natural and social. And it really concerns itself with distributions, interrelationships, connections between the environment and people. Sometimes it's more focused on people, and that's a human geography class. Sometimes it is focused more on natural aspects, so that would be physical geography or geology or climatology or any of those other disciplines that are more in tune with that natural world. Okay. Physical geography is, you know, this course is very shallow in that it covers a lot of information, but it doesn't cover it in great detail. So if that's what physical geography, any physical geography course is meant to sort of give you a bird's eye view of the discipline. So again, physical elements versus cultural elements. And as you can tell, a lot of this really sort of intertwines, interconnects uh, climate and weather affect population, economic activities, land, uh, uh, political systems, economic activities, right? Think about that. Um, language and religion are more sort of human political kind of systems, but they can still be affected by the physical world as well. There are five parts to the course. So think of these as the five portions that you see in the course guide and the syllabus. 
Again, we'll take it, get into geography and the why should you care. So here's a satellite image of the northeast of the United States, New England. And while this is an image of satellite, a satellite image of cloudiness, uh, it gives you a sense of what the, the terrain is like, where you find hillier terrain, where it's flatter. Uh, it's think of it as a, as a level of intelligence that is available through the environment. And in this case, in the in the form of satellite images, think about Google Earth or Google Maps and how much that has become a part of your life, even if you're not a geographer. All right, so look at this, for example, the newest volcano on Earth. Uh, this has since shut down, but this is a volcano in Iceland that didn't exist prior to 2021. And now it is a very significant cinder cone, uh, very obvious in the landscape in a place that is volcanic in nature to begin with. Or the tsunami in uh, in Japan in 2011, and how it affected essentially the entire oceanic basin of the Pacific Ocean. Okay, so how one event really, really far away can have consequences really the world over. And here's an image of that tsunami in northeastern Japan, and how literally because of a displacement of the crust under the ocean water, uh, eventually that water had to go somewhere and that somewhere was inland in Japan. Or Hurricane Irene in 2011 in the Northeast and how much rain that gave to Orange County and to Southern New York, New England, New Jersey, all the way down to North Carolina. Uh, again, these are natural events that have consequences, obviously, to the people who live there, their property, insurance rates, all that stuff is sort of connected. Religion. While this is a physical geography class, not really tied to the human as much, it is also important to realize that part of geography is understanding the people and the connections. Uh, so this is an image I took when I went to Israel some time ago, and from one vantage point, you can see the effect or the influence of three major world religions, Christianity, Islam, and Judaism. Or climate change, we'll definitely talk about this in the course, and the idea of, you know, a place really, really far away that has an impact on us here in the Northeast in New York. Uh, and that is what happens in that area of the world has repercussions, has ripple effects that carry in the system down the line. And whether it was 30, 40 years ago, 20, 30 years ago, 10, 20 years ago, now 10 years ago, into the future, you can sort of see that places evolve and change and a lot of it has to do with how the climate has changed, whether that is sea level rise or more intense tropical systems or more severe heat waves and drought and floods and cold spells. It's a change to the normal. And so therefore, something that needs to be considered. And again, we're talking about connections. Uh, here's an issue of environmental degradation. This is northeastern China, and this is dust wrapping around a low pressure. You, you can, it almost looks like um, milk or chocolate wrapping into like whipped cream. And these are clouds, and this is the dust wrapping around it. It's a function of the Gobi Desert and other desert regions in northeastern China. Saharan dust. So here is a dust plume that left the Sahara and carried across the Atlantic Ocean all the way to Texas in 2020. 
And so here you can see how places are connected and they're connected because of wind systems. And we'll talk about those wind systems coming up in another lesson. Again, some of the subfields of geography, you can stop this and look at it on your own. On the inside, you have physical geography. On the outside, you have the more specific um, disciplines that are related to the geographical discipline. Uh, Earth is a system so driven a system driven science uh, and by that i mean there are open systems and closed systems think about the water cycle water evaporates it condenses it falls again as snow and ice and rain it goes into the groundwater it becomes part of streams or rainfall and it goes right back into the ocean and so the process repeats over and over and over again uh, feedbacks are things that either are considered positive or they reinforce something or they are negative and they counteract something and so the whole world is full of these feedbacks uh, that are constantly interacting with one another yeah. here's an idea of a positive feedback more ice equals more sunlight that's reflected more reflected sunlight equals less heat and therefore less heat equals more ice okay and so the cycle repeats over and over and over and it is reinforced positive negative would be a volcanic eruption although you have a warm volcanic eruption to start the ash and gas that it expels then reflects sunshine at the surface and less sunshine equals colder temperatures. So one warm event eventually leads to cooling. And that would be considered a negative feedback because it counteracts. Positive reinforces, negative counteracts. Models. Why are models important? Um, you know, a model is a way of taking nature and simplifying it. It's a simplified version of reality. Um, you can focus on those things that you care about, those specific variables that are important or of interest to you, and you can ignore the rest. Models can be conceptual, like a map, or they can be numerical, like a weather forecast, what you get on your phone's weather app. That's a more numerical model. And again, weather forecasts aren't perfect, you know that, but it's still pretty good. It gives you an idea of what you can expect. So that's why it's called a model. Otherwise, it would be called reality if it was perfect. The Earth, again, the Earth is not a perfect sphere. It is sphere-like. Uh, it is fatter at the equator than it is at the poles. And the Earth rotates on its axis. That axis is pointed at a tilt. And the Earth orbit around the sun is more elliptical than circular. We'll get more into that coming up. Look at the idea of the Earth and how it stands today. That's the Earth as we know it, but it's been different in the past, and it will be different in the distant future. Of course, oceans or ocean, it's really one connected body of water. There is no completely isolated ocean in the world. Even the Mediterranean is connected to the Atlantic. And here's what the world looks without that water. So the topography of the ocean. Okay. The idea of day length and day length at June. So during our Northern Hemisphere summer, if you're at latitude 90 North, the North Pole, you have 24 hours of sunlight. 
But if you're at the South Pole, it's dark the entire time. And how it varies from 90 south all the way to 90 north. All right, so that's the first lesson. Pretty straightforward stuff. So let's go ahead and minimize that. Oh, we want to, there you go. Now we're going to look at week one, part two. Let's see here. Oh, I keep hitting the wrong button. Let's now look at this. And remember, if you want to just focus on one presentation at a time, that's great. Just you know where to stop and continue. But I really do recommend that you watch all of them. I mean, I'm not doing this for my own good. I'm doing this to cover the material as best I can and give you a different way of looking at it. So we're going to look at this right now, week one, part two. Looking at the Earth surface. So the objectives here is understanding what you see up there. What's map scale? What are projections? What's the difference between GPS and GIS? What's remote sensing? Those kinds of things. So the Earth is a sphere, a globe, not flat. I can't believe that's still something people argue about. It's a bit sad, but there it is. It's a globe. And because it's a globe, it has this, we use this system of latitude and longitude lines. Latitudes are also called parallels, what you see in image A. And longitude or meridians is what you see in image B. And when you put them together in image C, you have the grid. And when you open up your phone and you go to Google Maps, this is what you're seeing, essentially. That's it. That's what Google, you know, that little blue dot that beeps and or, you know, sort of blinks, that little blue dot, you know, where, you know what I'm talking about, that's this. It's telling you that you are at latitude, whatever, and longitude, whatever. You have, wherever you happen to be. So now, um, we'll talk about the idea of, you know, the important lines of latitude and longitude would be the prime meridian, zero degrees, and the equator, zero degrees north or south. And this would be zero degrees east or west. Now, global positioning system, this is not GP, I'm sorry, this is not GIS, this is GPS. So it was initially developed for the military long ago, and now it is what's basically available in just about everything. Your car, your phone, tablets, your desktop computers, aircraft, really everything. Uh, and it's a way of providing latitude, longitude, and elevation information that can then be recorded on a map and shown to you in some pretty little display. And in a remote location, you need at least three satellites to be able to tell where you are, which is why it's easier when you're in the middle of like a big, big, large city, or if you're in the middle of the desert in the Sahara, it's a little bit more complicated there. Map scale. This is pretty important. Map scale is used to depict the relationship between size and shape on a map versus the same item in the real world. So it is, you know, if you use Google Maps or Google Earth, it is that little, that little scale you see sort of at the bottom right of that program. It can be expressed as a ratio written out. It can tell you that 125,000 is a larger scale map than 1 to 50,000 because it shows a smaller area in greater detail. So let's look at that. Here's an image of the United States 
the Southeast, Georgia, and then Atlanta. Look at the number. Notice that this number is larger than that number, than that number, than that number. Yet this is the largest scale map. It's showing you all the roads around the city of Atlanta. Whereas the previous image just shows you the state of Georgia. And the previous image just shows you the southeastern United States. So here you see the whole US. Here you see just the Atlanta metro. But you can see more detail here. You could give directions, not great directions, but you could give directions to someone to get from the city of Tucker all the way that all the way down to College Park, for example. Not great directions, but you could give directions. You can do that with this map. Map essential. So this is a map of Africa showing you the individual countries and notice how there is latitude, longitude, there's a title, a legend, whatever the categories of data. And while this is an old map, 2009 already, it still gets the point across. Maps have to be used intelligently because frankly, you can lie with maps. And you have to use the right colors and the right shading colors that complement one another. You wouldn't go from blue to purple to black to yellow. You would use maybe shades of blue or shades of green, or in this case, shades of some form of red in order for it to make sense visually. Okay. Projections. So a projection is what happens when you project a flat, a, a sphere onto a flat surface. So imagine for a second that you take an orange, right? A ball, a sphere, and now you take the skin, you skin that orange, and you take that skin and you flatten it out. You're not going to get a perfect little square, are you? It's all going to be like torn apart. And that's basically what's happening when you take a globe and you turn it into a projection. It distorts. So you can, you can distort all kinds of things about a map. You can't keep all the properties intact. And so a map can't be both equivalent, which would be this one equal area or conformal, which is this one here. Here, the shape is distorted. Here, the area is distorted. So let's look at some examples of that. Notice how big uh, Greenland looks here. In fact, it looks almost the size of Africa. Well, that's wrong. Africa is 13 times bigger than Greenland. Look it up. Look it up on a globe. Um, they, they use a face to, to show you how that face or that head would be distorted. Here, you're distorting the size. Here, you're distorting the shape. Antarctica is not this big. <laughs> But what's happened is you've stretched it out and it has distorted the shape, whereas this one distorted the size. Okay. Notice how much bigger Antarctica looks. Look, notice how much bigger um, Greenland looks. You can use maps to look straight down at the pole. So this map is accurate at the pole and it becomes less so as you get away from it. There's in a map something called isolines, which are basically lines connecting points of equal anything. So in this case, precipitation, notice the nice shades of green from light green to darker, 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 and darker still. So where it is darker, it rains more. Make sense? 
And then the image on the right is a contour map, a map that you would use when you go hiking, for example, if you go to Harriman State Park or somewhere in the Catskills or the Adirondacks. Here is this contour map, and this is what an image would look like if you were, if you were sort of flying towards it. This is this. This is looking from above. This is looking at it from the side. Here's another example of isolines. This happens to be precipitation in inches or centimeters across the state of Florida. Remote sensing, that's, and, and, and what is it? So remote sensing is both a science and an art because it's the idea of measuring or acquiring information about something when you're far from it. So imagine that you want to examine some field and you get up on a balloon and you sort of quietly fly over it and you take images of it. You're not in direct contact with whatever it is you're looking at, but you're still collecting information about it. So that's remote, get it? Remote sensing. Uh, remote sensing in Google Earth. Uh, Google Earth, basically you need to use, in fact, I need to update, it should be Google Chrome and Google uh, and, and Firefox both work on it. Uh, there are no accounts to get, no passwords to remember, and it's used in our homework quite a bit. Like, it is a significant number of points in many of the homework, so take advantage of it. It is a free resource. It doesn't cost you anything. Uh, you don't even have to have a password to remember, as long as you have Google Chrome or Firefox. All right. And again, remote sensing is basically uh, measuring the interaction of the world with infrared visible kind of light. This is what we see. Our eyes can see the visible spectrum, obviously. But there's energy that the sun radiates on either side of this little thin spectrum that we can't see with our eyes. And so here's an image of remote sensing. This is all the fire smoke uh, a couple of years ago in California and Nevada and Utah, Idaho, Washington, Oregon, Montana, Wyoming. You can see that it looks like smoke, right? Clouds are white. Forests are green. Water is blue, well, smoke is sort of gray. And there it is. So you can see the effect of so many fires across the Western US. Here's the idea of uh, loss of ice uh, in Antarctica. So you can use remote sensing images from space to be able to tell what's happening. Remember, February is summer in Antarctica, not winter. Here is the city of Dubai from space. So you can see a lot of uh, like um, urban usage of urban space uh, development, that kind of thing. Here's Hurricane Irma in uh, 2017 and what those islands looked like before the hurricane and after the hurricane, like somebody mowed them down. GIS, not to be confused with GPS, it is the usage of layered data to analyze and display information in order to make decisions, frankly, smarter. So that's what GIS is very, very useful for. And you can basically map just about 
anything you want. And you can sort of layer all these maps on top of one another. And frankly, it helps you to make really smart decisions about business location, um, where to build things, what's the what's a good neighborhood to set up something, whether it be a business or housing or whatever. So GIS is not GPS. Remember that. And so that's the next lesson. So now that's two out of four slide packets done. So if you want to take a break, please do. We're moving on to week one, part three. So now we're getting into the atmosphere. I'm taking a little water break. So let's move on to this one. Earth-Sun relationships, radiation, heat balance, and how it affects us down here. So these are the objectives for the lesson. Again, we're dealing with oceanic and atmospheric processes. So in the end, we're talking about weather. We have to begin by understanding the Earth and its relationship to its star. And what happens is the Earth is has a pretty circular orbit, but it is slightly more elliptical than it is circular. So you are closer to the sun or the Earth is closer to the sun in January and farther away in July. Yet this is our yet this is our summer and this is our winter, so that difference doesn't really affect the climate as much. What does is the fact that the Earth is tilted on its axis, and there you see it. The Earth is tilted from the vertical at around twenty three and a half degrees. And what that means is that there are environmental effects to rotation. So one such effect, you experience this daily, right? There are diurnal rhythms, consistent flow patterns of air and water, and the movement of tides. Now, the fact that we have a tilted Earth that rotates about the sun is what leads to what we call the seasons. Okay, so now in December, the northern hemisphere is tilted away from the sun, so days are short and cold. But in June, we are tilted toward the sun and therefore our days are longer and warmer. The opposite happens in the Southern Hemisphere. And that right there is the reason that we have seasons. That's it. That's the basic, basic reason why there are seasons on Earth. Now, here is a top-down view. This is the Earth in December. Notice this is shadow. Notice in June, this is all sun. And notice in either September or March, is sort of halfway. Equal not. Equal day, equal night. That's what that means. So as of, you know, the beginning of summer term, we are basically right about here, right? Spring started, not quite summer yet. So we're, hit, we're sort of in this leg right here, this arm of the rotation. But think back to the fall term and how the days are getting shorter. And eventually before winter break, it's really, really dark. And it gets dark around what, 4.30? 
Yet by the time June rolls around, it'll be light at 5.30 in the morning or earlier than that. So that's the idea of rotation of a tilted Earth about the sun. Uh, here's the midnight sun. So if you live in a place like Antarctica, let's just call it because people actually live down there. What happens is during your summer, the sun never sets. And there's a cool video on the um, uh, discussion this week that kind of goes over this. Again, we went over this earlier. The idea of day length, depending on latitude. So if you live near the equator, frankly, your day doesn't change much from month to month. And if you've ever lived in a tropical place like Puerto Rico or uh, Brazil, you know this. You know, every day is about 12 hours, roughly. This right here, it's a little bit sort of glaring, right? So many colors. But what this is trying to tell you is this is latitude on this axis. This, these are the months, January, February, March, April, May. And so in June, July, in the Southern Hemisphere, it's basically really, really cold and there's very, very, very light. There's not much heat. As you head into the same time of the year, June, July, the Northern Hemisphere, you have a great surplus of energy. But notice, if you live near the equator, it hardly changes shade. It's that same orange shade. And the same thing goes for day length. Again, the x-axis versus the y-axis. X-axis is time of the year, months. And the x and the y-axis would be latitude, longitude. I'm sorry, latitude. Intensity of radiation with latitude, the closer to the equator you are, the more direct the sun hits you, so the more intense it feels. And again, if you've ever been to a tropical location, and if you're pretty fair skin, you need like FPF like 100, because it is remarkably intense. Heating the atmosphere. Again, we have measures of temperature. And again, temperatures have not only diurnal rhythms, but they have seasonal rhythms. And this is a map, not a map, a chart of temperatures in, Aust in Saudi Arabia from June 2001 to June 2002. It was as hot as 132 degrees that year and as cold as about 50 Four. So there you go. 54 may not seem very cold, but compared to 132, it is. Energy, the idea of wavelength. So the sun emits in the shorter wavelength part of the spectrum. The sun is most efficient at emitting here. The Earth, on the other hand, is a much cooler object and it emits in the infrared, which you can't see. That's a heat signature. But it makes sense. The sun is hotter, so it is more energetic, and it emits at a far shorter wavelength. The Earth is a much cooler object, and so it emits at a much longer wavelength. This is called terrestrial radiation or long wave energy, this is short wave or solar radiation. Albedo. Albedo is a cool little term. It simply means the reflection of energy. So imagine, you know, why is it that you don't wear a black shirt and black pants and a black hat in summer? because it is going to absorb energy and you're going to feel hotter. 
you wear white clothing or light colored clothing. So that's the idea of albedo. And it ties into this little acronym, insulation, which is short for incoming solar radiation. And here's the idea of uh, albedo. So for example, this one here is the Sahara Desert. It's full of sand. So notice how it doesn't really change from August to February or February to August, since it's the same year. It's very bright. Notice how it does change. Ah, oh, look at this. February, very reflective up here. It's covered in snow. But in summer, it's covered in grass. Grass is darker, so it's less reflective. Make sense? Uh, energy or using thinking of thinking of energy as a as a global budget. So because we have an atmosphere, we trap energy that's trying to escape. So the Earth is a livable planet at around 15 Celsius or 59 Fahrenheit. If the Earth didn't have an atmosphere, it would be a very, very, very cold place, which probably wouldn't support life, at least as we know it. Now, these are some of the uh, heating and cooling mechanisms. So radiation, conduction, convection, and latent heat. You're probably familiar with these three. You're probably less familiar with this one. So let's look at conduction, which is molecule to molecule transfer. Think about putting a skillet on the stove, and for about five, 10 minutes, you can touch that metal. But don't touch it in about an hour, because you're going to burn yourself. And the heat is transferred from hot to cold. Again, a metal rod into a fire, and the conduction arrows show you how it goes from hot to cold. And it's molecule to molecule transfer of heat. Convection. Maybe you have a convection oven. Maybe you have one of these old crackly radiators in your house. That's convection. It's a loop. It's heat transfer from one point to another through fluid. So it can be air or it can be a boiling pot of water or a pot of boiling water. That's probably a way of saying it better. Even though I wrote it wrong there. The pot, it's not boiling, the water is. <laughs> uh, advection, when the dominant direction of the heat transfer is in the horizontal. So think about the first really warm spell that we get in spring. That air is coming from the Gulf of Mexico, where it is warmer. That's advection. Now, adiabatic, there's, we're going to hit this topic more throughout the term. So there's more, and I say week three, frankly, it's coming up during, I need, I need to make corrections on this, but in any event, so let's look at the idea of latent heat. And that is the idea of changes of state involving the absorption or release of heat to or from the environment. So evaporation and condensation. Evaporation is a cooling process. Think about what happens when you take a hot shower and you come out of the shower into the open air bathroom, you feel cool because evaporation has taken place. So it requires energy to, vapor, to vaporize that water and that energy comes from the environment. So the net result is you feel colder. And finally, the greenhouse effect, lowering the atmosphere or, the, or heating the lower atmosphere, rather. It's a combination of all these processes we talked about, convection, conduction, latent heat release. Okay, so here are some of the um, controls of temperature. So latitude, altitude, proximity or distance away from water, and ocean currents. So here's the idea of latitude. Notice how it says summer 
versus winter up here. And notice what happens as you go from month to month. So this is winter here and now summer here and winter down here. Here's the idea of temperature range, how much the temperature goes from, from the high point of the year to the low point of the year. Notice the further inland you are, the bigger that difference. And the closer in the water you are, the less. Again, latitude and the idea of insulation. And notice how it changes from December to June. Remember, it is much darker up here in December, so there is less insulation. There is less solar energy in June down here. So notice how the values are lower. Angle of incidence becomes a big, big deal. Again, if you're at the equator, the sun can make a 90 degree angle to the top of your head, meaning it is directly above you. Whereas if you're very far north latitude, the angle of incidence that that energy hits you at is really, really small. So it's a much more thinned out amount of energy. So it doesn't feel as intense. And again, the idea of the sun rays and the angle they make with the surface, depending on your latitude. So they barely make an impact way up north, and they are directly above a particular latitude, depending on where the Earth is, in its rotation about the sun. Here's an image of Death Valley. Think of it as a big convection oven. The sun heats the valley floor, and that air then rises up the mountain, it cools, and then it sinks again, and then it rises and cools and so on. That is a convection loop that can set up there. Land water contrast, think about it. It gets much colder in central Pennsylvania than it does in the Jersey Shore. That's because Jersey Shore is immediately next to the ocean. Central Pennsylvania is not. So that distance away from water makes a difference. Water has a high specific heat. That means water basically heats up slowly, but it also cools down slowly as well. So it retains the heat longer. Land can heat up fast, but it also cools down fast. Think about it when you walk, go walking on sand on the beach. If you stick your feet into the sand, it feels cool immediately, right? So that's the idea of specific heat land versus water. Here's two cities, Dallas and San Diego, roughly the exact same latitude. But look at the difference. Dallas gets hotter in summer and colder in winter. San Diego is popular for a reason. It never gets too hot, but it never gets too cold either. Ocean currents make a big, big difference, whether they are warm or cold, depicted as blue or red arrows. And ocean currents basically transport a lot of heat north or south, depending on where you happen to be. And here's an image uh, of temperature. Notice the Gulf Stream. There it is. 
taking heat from the Gulf of Mexico north in towards Europe. So this is excess heat in the form of warm ocean currents carried along the eastern US on its way towards Europe, which is why Europe never really gets very, very cold. At least Western Europe doesn't, because it is bathed in relatively warm water coming in from the Gulf Stream. Mechanisms of heat transfer will be ocean and the atmosphere, obviously. So in the atmosphere, we're talking about storms, hurricanes, winter, nor'easters, thunderstorms, and then oceanic circulations. Well, you're talking about ocean currents, which we just mentioned before. So let's look at the idea of radiation and the globe. And if you're at the equator, there's more energy coming in than leaving. And if you're towards higher latitude, the opposite happens. Okay. The environmental lapse rate, that is basically the vertical change in temperature. And typically temperatures decrease with height. So if you go to the, that's why you see snow covered mountains. However, every once in a while, you will have temperature increase with height, and that's basically referred to as an inversion. An inversion is something that's considered to be stable, and that stability can then trap things like fog and pollutants near the surface. And here's an example of an inversion right here. Cooler at the surface, warmer above, and then cooler again. And there it is, Los Angeles. It's the perfect example of an inversion. Temperature is increasing with height and then cooling. So it creates what's called a thermodynamic lid. And all the pollutants are basically kept there. There it is. All right, obviously not week three. Nope. Now we're moving on to week one, part um, four, almost done. So here we're talking about the idea of the composition and structure of the atmosphere. Again, take a break stop the presentation, have a sandwich, drink some coffee, and come back to it. These are the lesson objectives for this particular slide packet. Again, the atmosphere is a thin envelope around the surface of the planet composed primarily of oxygen and nitrogen. Frankly, way more nitrogen than oxygen and also some other gases like CO2 and water vapor, which are key greenhouse gases. Here is the idea of the breakdown. Notice 78% by volume, 20% oxygen, 21. And then all the other components are much, much smaller. So every time you breathe in, you take in a little neon, a little argon, a little helium, a little krypton, hydrogen, water vapor, CO2, every time you breathe. So that's fresh air, and these are the greenhouse or variable gases. Greenhouse gas, CO2, it's natural, but it's highly variable stored in plants, released by volcanoes, and also stored in the oceans. It traps, here's the key to CO2, it traps the energy that the Earth is trying to give off. So therefore, it helps keep the planet warm. 
That's the basic idea of why it's called the greenhouse gas. Increasing amounts released to the burning of fossil fuels, mostly. And here's what's happened to CO2 when it began to be measured in 1958, up, down, up, down. The basic idea is the pattern continues the seesaw, but definitely up. Water vapor, highly variable. It's the only surface that can be found in all three phases on Earth. It's responsible for the absorption and release of heat. Remember that term, latent heat? And it's obviously key to weather, tropical storms and winter nor'easters and that kind of thing. Air pressure and density. So air density is mass over unit volume. How much stuff is in a given space? Air pressure is a force per unit area. And it's basically the weight of the atmosphere above you. And the changes vary both change very rapidly with increasing altitude. Okay. So basically, if you're at the very, very top of Mount Everest, 70% of the atmosphere is already below you. That's how quickly it changes. And Everest is about five miles up, a little more than that. Now, there are four main layers to the atmosphere. The troposphere and stratosphere are the two that we're going to focus on. But at the bottom, we have the troposphere, which is where weather happens. General decrease of temperature with height, and it's very well mixed. That's about the average thickness of it. The stratosphere is separated from the troposphere by what's called a tropopause, where the temperature stops decreasing, stops, slows, and begins to increase with height. And the increase of temperature with height is as a result of the absorption of energy by ozone. And then you have these other two layers, the mesosphere and the thermosphere. This is where you find things like the aurora, borealis, and all that other phenomenon that you tend to observe in very northern or very southern latitudes. And by that I mean near the north or south poles. Human-induced changes. Obviously climate change, we'll talk about that. Depletion of the ozone layer. Air pollution. So the ozone layer is basically something that humans caused, and frankly, we've begun to fix it, which is a good thing. So the ozone layer is typically found up here, at around 25 kilometers up in the atmosphere. And it's actually a very good thing up there. It helps block ultraviolet energy. But the destruction of it is when you introduce all these different chemicals that take the O3, which is ozone, and break it up into molecular and atomic oxygen. And these chemicals that we've introduced into the atmosphere called chlorofluorocarbons introduce chlorine into the mix and they tend to destroy ozone. These Chemicals have been banned, and the ozone hole is actually being fixed as we speak, quite frankly. And so basically, if nothing had been done by mid-century, it would have spread across the Earth. However, we have done something about it, and as a result, um, the problem is starting to go away. So it's been a good, a good result. And they were banned in 1987. It's called the Montreal Protocol. 
Air pollution, there are two types, primary and secondary. Primary is direct entry. Secondary is as a result of a chemical reaction. So these are some of the particulates and nasty things that are in the atmosphere. Again, we looked at this. One of them is Los Angeles on the left, on the right rather. And the other one is, I believe, Santiago, Chile. And one of these secondary types, it's called smog, which is a combination of fog, which is water vapor, combined with smoke, creating a very nasty little soup called smog. Weather, what is weather? What's the definition of weather versus climate? Well, weather is the highly changeable measurement of all that stuff. What's it gonna be like tomorrow? How about next week? Is it gonna rain? How much snow are we gonna get? That's weather. Here's a weather forecast map. Climate, on the other hand, is the average of weather. And it's usually averaged over decades by taking many, many, many observations and averaging it all out. You can easily see seasonal patterns, meaning when should you expect rain? Is it which month is your wettest month on average? When do you typically get your snow? Uh, what happens to the temperatures in April versus June versus August? It is an average of conditions. So weather is here now, climate is long term. What controls the weather and the climate? Well, ocean currents, quite frankly. Here's the idea of Temperature, water temperature, and this is a really old map, but it gets the point across, so no need to change it. This is water temperatures in January. Water temperatures in September. January, September. Get it? Obviously, things heat up and change over time. There's a seasonal shift that takes place. Notice how here, it's cold the entire time. And you really have to get to a lower latitude before you start getting some kind of warming taking place. This is why hurricane season happens, oh, roughly between June and October. Because it takes a while for the ocean to heat up. Here's an image again of September, but now we're looking at the entire world. September, January, January, September. You see the shift? Same map. Topographic barriers, that's another control of climate. So depending on wind direction, some places can be very, very wet or very, very dry. So for example, the trade winds, which we'll get into in another lesson, hit the northeastern side of the Big Island. And Hilo gets about 150 inches of rain a year. In the same island, but on the other side, the town of Puaco gets about nine inches of rain a year. That's it, nine inches, same island, 150 inches. That's all as a function of topography. Land water. It's another control of climate. Something, a place considered maritime. Think about Florida versus, say, Nebraska in the middle of the country. And in fact, here's San Francisco and Omaha, Nebraska. Notice how much warmer and colder Omaha gets than San Francisco. And here's the city of Berkoyansk in Russia, in the middle of Siberia. It gets pretty mild in summer and ridiculously cold in winter. So there's a huge temperature swing throughout the year. And again, 
January, July. Altitude, my favorite mountain, K2. Um, altitude plays a big, big role. Notice how down here, no snow, there's some ice, but up here, snow. And if you ever take a ride in the West Coast, like Colorado, Wyoming, Montana, you can drive through this. You can start off in the desert and go up a hill, a mountain, and in about 10 miles, you're sort of in pines. And if you go high enough, you'll get to snow. And you haven't even driven 20, 30 miles. So remember, temperature decreases with height. And what is temperature? Well, temperature is a measure of the molecular energy, um, the kinetic energy of molecules in a particular, in whatever, a substance, liquid, metal, air. Okay? So, the warmer an object is, the more kinetic energy the object's molecules have. And lapse rate and temperature and stability. Temperature lapse rate is simply the change in temperature with height. So imagine you send the balloon, and the balloon every 100 meters tells you, here's my temperature, here's my temperature, here's my temperature, and then you graph it. And you can graph the lapse rate, okay? If it's getting colder, you draw it as a negative. If it's getting warmer with height, then you draw it as a positive. And here is a lapse rate, general lapse rate of the atmosphere. In the lower part, it decreases, then it increases, then it decreases again. So these are the different uh, lapse rates and temperatures associated with that. And there's more to come on adiabatic process. This is kind of an introduction to it, but we'll get to it next week. So an adiabatic process is heating or cooling that takes place just because the pressure changes. So imagine you buy a bag of chips at the beach. Then you get in the car and you drive to a resort, a ski resort, at 12,000 feet that bag of chips is going to look like a pillow because there's going to be less pressure acting on it so it's going to puff up because there's less pressure keeping it compressed so what happens is as pressure decreases your temperature also will decrease this is called an adiabatic process and in the atmosphere it works to basically lead to clouds and condensation and again this image here We'll get to it next class as well, but you need to sort of think about the idea of when the air is unsaturated, the humidity is less than 100%, and you will cool at this rate. And when you eventually reach condensation, you get moisture, cloud, the humidity is 100%, and now you cool, but at a different rate, okay? This is what happens moist flow gets forced up and over a mountain it rains or snows and you get fog and clouds on this side but then when the air goes down the other side it dries up because the moisture was spent on this side and that's called orographic lifting orography is nothing but a fancy word for terrain okay and here's a good example, the state of Oregon and Washington. Here you have the Cascade Mountains. This is called the windward side. So that would be this. This is called the leeward side. That would be this. Notice Bend, Oregon. Bend, Oregon. This city, Eugene, Oregon, would be uh, roughly in here. Eugene, there it is. 
And notice how it is very green on this side and very brown on that side. It doesn't rain much on this side. And what happens again, this is what my own you lift air, it condenses, it expands at a lesser rate because latent heat is being released. It continues and then it goes down the other side, compressing and warming at that original rate. So it is dry adiabatic here, moist adiabatic here, dry adiabatic here. And stability, as defined by your book, is basically when something is unstable, if you push it, it will continue. But if it's stable and you push on something, it go, it'll go back to where it was. Stable versus unstable. In terms of the atmosphere, instability leads to thunderstorms and unsettled weather. Stable usually leads to good weather, fog, calm. Okay. Here's an example of an unstable atmosphere, a big old thunderstorm. Notice how it's bubbling. And then temperature inversions lead to pollution trapping. And so Beijing, Mexico City, LA. And here's an example of one. That's a stable or a lid that's trapping all the moisture and fog and smoke, and if there was a big fire somewhere in here, all that smoke would get basically caught at that low level. Here's fog. Notice how it's sort of trapped in the lowest part. So I need to make those changes so it doesn't say week four. Next week is week two <laughs> in the summer. So that's the... Uh, presentations. It's a lot, right? So again, I recommend you do it a chunk at a time, do it piecemeal, and you'll be better off. Otherwise, I look forward to interacting with you again. If you have any questions, get with me, come to the uh, office hour. And otherwise, I hope you do well. Bye.